Welcome to the Brett Davis Podcast. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm very blessed to have two people that I highly admire and that are really just amazing individuals that have decided to work together on this great project that we're going to talk about. Of course, Laura Castaneda, who's a legend in her own rights. Oh, I say that. You yes. <laughs> Breakthrough in many, 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 many uh, ways, bilingual, in media, now with the Union Tribune, and also documentary film uh, expert. Uh, you've been a professor. I mean, we can go on and on. And she's responsible for many uh, careers. A lot of people in San Diego that are in the business always say Laura's the one that got them started. Well, yeah. and then, and then, of course, this fine gentleman who everybody, I'm sure, recognizes is <laughs> the one and only Tommy Sablon is uh, somebody that uh, I have always watched uh, to learn from from afar because, you know, he's um, he's just been doing it for so long, so well, and so consistent. Well, I, I got into radio in uh, 1982, right out of high school, as I was leaving high school, and it's been a it's been a whirlwind. But as we get ready to talk about the documentary that Laura and the Net you know, put together. I do want to give a shout out to you and Larry with the big dump. I mean, you know, the Coronado Island Film Festival highlights a lot of documentaries, but the one to see is the big dump. And what's it about exactly? Well, it's not about a toilet, <laughs> but uh, it about, is it is about the ocean and the way it's been uh, desecrated for so long. Yes. And, uh, this is a thing that involves as everybody knows the story and a lot of people are crazy i know two people i met in coronado in the last two weeks didn't even know yeah it was going on and they live in coronado right yeah. and that's very close to what's going on in in imperial beach and the tijuana sewage and all that mess and it's so cool that you and larry and all whoever produced that film uh have put it together because that's an important thing that is happening right now and has been since 1980. yeah well, Sarah's also the producer, and as you can tell, she really is the boss, as you can see. You know, for Sarah, you know, um, I'm concerned. Uh, we're South Bay guys. Yeah, you've been in San Diego also, Laura, for a while. Uh, I'm concerned for not only the citizens of San Diego, but the citizens of Tijuana, mm -hmm. because this is now taken on based on what UCSD is saying. It's an air quality thing. So even if you don't even live in the area or you go on the water, you can live in the East County. And on a windy day, whatever's in the air from the water mm -hmm. is in the air. It's bad. It's and real so, bad. So, I mean, this is a really top concern. And, and of course, I don't want, this is not about our film. You shouldn't have got me started talking. <laughs> because I, I want to talk more about your film. But there is something to say about San Diego and we're just beautiful melting pot yes. of cultures. And uh, I don't want to see more people get ill. I mean, especially the area we grew up in. It just doesn't. Right. I met I met one of your daughters. We want her to have a good life and be able to swim in IB once. I think the last time someone surfed in IB was probably me in 1983. And uh, we got to get that I was, back. That's when I used to go out there. Yes. Isn't yeah. that crazy? That's why we don't get sick. <laughs> <laughs> so how did you both, uh, first of all, uh, you got into your career. How did, how, did that, how did you get into your career? Um, you can be honest about this. I was in high school and I was getting ready to ditch school. And I had a guitar in one hand and Caroline Silva in the other. And I was wow. leaving lunch. And my counselor at the time, Mr. Charles Dappert, said, Tommy, you know, please don't do that to Caroline. Do not go. <laughs> he goes, why don't you, uh, you know, make sure Caroline goes to school. But there's a guy talking about radio in the cafeteria right now. He goes, why don't you go listen to him since you have a guitar and you like music? So I went in there and his name was Jonathan Lang from KBS 95. And he did a bunch of trivia questions like Beatles and Stones. And me, you know, I wasn't showing off, but I just knew everything. And I knew all the answers before he finished his question. And he, he got a kick out of that. And then later on that day, I get a phone call at my house on a landline, that green phone. That green phone rang. We picked it up and it was... Mr. Dappert and Jonathan Lang saying, "Hey, Mrs. Sablon, uh, we want we want to invite your uh, your son to the radio station and uh, to give him a tour." And so my mom drove up to a place called Kearney Mesa. <laughs> that I've, you know, I'm from Chulavis. I never really drove up the 805. We stopped off in a, on Convoy Court to KVS 95, and I got a tour. And I've been in radio in the media ever since. 
And, uh, and this is all in the documentary. <laughs> How long is the documentary? It's just over 20 minutes. And, okay. you know, uh, things probably would have been very different had we done what you did for your documentary, you know, sat down, had a meeting about it, sought funding, you know, had apparently a producer. You don't know how, apparently you don't know how we made our movie. Thing. Well, <laughs> a lot of times the best movies are made over a conversation, right? And that's what happened. Um, my students actually uh, from City College uh, back in the day, I want to say like seven years ago, okay. were the ones that started the documentary um, at, at my recommendation. Because what happened was I didn't even know that Tommy Sablon had gone to City College. And I was a full professor, full-time professor at City College. And it was always my mission to try to find former students and start what we call the Wall of Fame, which your photo is still missing, by the way. Mm -hmm. Wow. And, um, oh, by the way, you know, I also went to school there. I didn't uh, know so. that. Well, that's what I'm saying. We would, I would look for them, for the, you know, the alumni and just try to have that partnership with the people that were in media meet our students, come and speak, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But I didn't know he went there. I was a DJ at KSDS Radio, Jazz 88. I did not know that. And my classes that I took, you know, I was a, a big time scholar. I took typing and running. So uh, <laughs> back in the <laughs> day, city up. was the place to, to go to learn for how media. to type. I mean, no, for media, <laughs> for all things media. And so um, based on some of the posts that I started to see Tommy put on Facebook because we, we became Facebook friends. I was like, Oh my gosh, first of all, I didn't know he went to city. And second of all, this guy has an amazing story. So I asked to meet with him to, we had a cup of coffee in Chula Vista and yeah. we started talking about it. And he was like, why me? Why me? Why are you interested? That is in a me? trip. It, it still is a trip. That's a trip. Uh, and well, because I still say why me? And I think the year was 2016. And uh, I got to meet Crystal and that original group of kids, and uh, we became almost we came we became kind of family. Yeah. And then it, the they year, followed you around. Yeah, a lot they, they came cameras. into my house. I mean, we were the we were the we were the Kardashians before the Kardashians. <laughs> and uh, we, um, but then the years went by, and then a year uh, named 2020 came around, yeah. specifically March 2020, and then the world changed, and then I actually forgot about it. And then Laura uh, called me after, you know, things settled down in the world and said, hey, remember that documentary? And I was like kind of saying, you know, do you still want to do this? I mean, really? And she wouldn't let up. And then she she and Nanette Sosa from the University of Arkansas together, they are the ones that completed it along with the new kids. No, right? actually, there were no new kids involved. Really? What happened was the new kids at University of Arkansas. Uh, the no, there stuff. were no students involved at this okay. point. What happened was, um, and you can see we haven't even really talked about <laughs> this, but um, I felt bad the whole time. Like, you know, uh -huh. the kids, when I say the kids, they're not kids, they're adults. A lot of students oh, yeah. come from all walks of life at City College, so they're not kids, but I call them my kids. Um, Crystal Martinez yeah. and uh, Maria Murcio, they um, really were the ones that, wanted to finish it, but they never did. And so life got in the way and they sure. all started graduating and happens. left, they got jobs. And so finally I contacted Maria, Murcia actually, not Murcia, sorry, Maria. Um, and she happens to live across the street from a small office space that I rent in um, Normal Heights. So I see her once in a while and we wave, but I messaged her and I said, "Where are? where's all the hard drives? Where's the footage? Where's the, the lost footage? Where? Yes. And so yeah. she and I and the other uh, student producer met and they handed everything off to me. And I could tell they felt really, really bad. Like, you're going to finish this now without us. And I was like, you know what? I feel like I owe it to this guy. Mm, I mean, no, not at all. You don't tell somebody that you're going to do something on their life and then not finish it. So I think I think it might be the time. We were, we were talking earlier about when we were born, 1964, that period of time, I think there was a lot of um, pressure from parents to do those types of things. Mm -hmm. Not to say that there isn't now, but it just really was. Keep your word, you mean? Yeah. Yeah. I, I felt wow. really bad about it. And so another cup of coffee happens with my dear friend, Nanette Sosa, who you may remember, uh, she worked in media here in San Diego in the 90s. 
Um, she worked at Kogo. Then she left San Diego and went to CNN. I mean, she's very wow. polished. I mean, wow. very experienced and polished in radio. And so I just have, we're both professors, right? So I mentioned to her about this documentary and how it was just kind of sitting there. And I said, Nanette, you know Tommy Sablon, right? You, do you, but you don't know his backstory. So I told her the, what I knew. And she's like, let's finish it. And I said, well, there, we have no budget. Five years have gone by. A pandemic has gone by. Can we pull it off? And she said, we will pull it off. Mm -hmm. And so now Nanette is in Arkansas at the University of Arkansas. And so she sought out a professional editor. who wasn't a student editor, but, you know, it was no budget. It was us saying we're going to finish this. And so I wish we could have gone back. And when I, that's why I said earlier about your document. I wish we could have gone back and, you know, interviewed Jeff and Jer and, and Laura at Kane and other people. That's that part I, two. That, you know, maybe because we <laughs> never interviewed be, them. They're, they're we honestly, never interviewed them. Yeah, honestly, I know a little bit about his, about every, everybody in San Diego knows this guy. He's an amazing, yes, he's but Mr. They don't, San Diego. Uh, they don't, some people don't know his home backstory outside of the professional media situation. And that's where, and that's where you focused on. Well, you know, it, it's it's so riveting. How could you not? And and I'm not saying well, this because, I think no, I'm not saying this because you're sitting in front of me. What I'm saying is, you know, a lot of people that make it in this industry or in any industry, they have that full on family support. There's both parents. There's older brothers and sisters pushing you. There's this and that. And you didn't necessarily <laughs> have that path. So to find out his story and what he's done for this community. And which is highlighted and, and continues to do and continues to do yeah. um that is a huge part of the story and to be the only uh, the first rather the first and one, only uh, <laughs> the first <laughs> producer yeah to be in now that that i'm radio proud of, hall of fame. i mean right that there is... i'm the first and only producer um in the national radio hall of fame that's in chicago and it and it was when i was with jeff and jer who are my brothers and a lot in my life you know, is happening because of being on Jeff and Jer. But before Jeff and Jer, I was raised by a single mom. And that's kind of what the documentary is about, is my mom. Uh, my dad died when I was five, Father's Day, 1970. And um, my mom raised me. I didn't know I was missing out on a dad. Or I don't know if I missed out on having a dad because I had my mom and I had my family and I had Chula Vista. My brothers, as they were growing up, just like today, many kids, um, got addicted to that opioid you know in heroin and in the 70s my uh my my uh, brothers were addicted to heroin and stayed addicted for a couple of decades but they were clean at the end and that's where my story is because i've seen a lot you know there no business for a eight-year-old kid eight-year-old tommy uh sitting in a car holding a spoon you know <laughs> And you know, that's the part that I think a lot of people uh, don't know. And so as I got uh, to know Tommy's story, that's where Nanette and I said, this has to be part, this is part of his story. And if he's okay telling that part of the story, then I think that there's a lot to offer in terms of younger people, whether you're talking about uh, media or not, you know, any, any life lesson, right. Uh, that, uh, that it can be done. If you make the decision yes. that you're going to turn I'm, things around and you're going to, and by now you have a family and yeah, all these other dynamics. I'm saying all these we, other dynamics. We are from, Brett's from West Side, Chula Vista. You know, I'm from the West Side of Chula Vista on Palomar Street. And, you know, I think chances of us having to make a decision one year of our lives, you know, do we go that way or that way? Luckily, I chose uh, kind of the right way and, uh, and, and had a career just like Brett. Um, and... It's admirable, and, Tommy. And, 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 and I know you're not the kind of guy that's going to stand up there and say, look at me, look at me. That's well, actually, I am. I actually, I kind of am. <laughs> that's not who you are. But, uh, but, but, uh, and, and you see that in the documentary, but, you know. But being with Jeff and Jer, everything, you know, that I was a part of, you know, happened because I was on Jeff and Jer from, you know, uh, Breaking and Entering Christmas to so many, Becky's House, a shelter for domestic violence. Uh, Talk about the gentleman um, that called from, was it Claremont that called you? For breaking in on Christmas? Yeah, talk so, about that. You know, uh, we've been doing it every year since 1996, and it's called Little Tommy's Breaking and Entering Christmas, we'll be, which will be on KUSI Saturday, December 9th, and then Fox 5 will replay it at night. Um, and 
it started with a phone call back in 1996. Jeff and Jerry were on the air, and I was just taking phone calls. And I pick up a phone, and it's a, a, a single dad with two little girls. And he said, hey, Tommy, this was off the air. Tommy, I'm not looking for any money or any handouts. I just need a job interview. I do construction. And then I, I said, hey, would you go on the air? And he goes, yeah. So he went on the air and said that, that story, and our listeners liked him. And so we got him a job interview on the spot at a construction site. And for some reason, I guess he, he mentioned he lived in Claremont. And when he went to that job interview in the morning, I said, hey, I, I, I'm going to get my phone that back then used to carry a phone like this, a, a cell phone. Yeah, the brick, brick, the brick. Yeah, <laughs> a briefcase phone. And I went to Kmart live on the radio, got a big cart, got a tree, got uh, Barbies, games, uh, cologne, food, a bunch of stuff. And I loaded that uh, grocery cart, put it in my car and drove to his house. And at the time I was able to fit through a window and uh, I crawled through the window and I, and I set up a Christmas for him. Nobody was there. And, and it looked, it looked beautiful. It looked like Christmas. And then I, as I was getting ready to leave, um, I was telling Jeff and Cheryl, okay, we did it. Um, and then I described what was happening and I noticed right behind me, was a on top of the television was a family photo which included a mom and on that oh, photo man. and on that photo was a rose a rosary wow. and the funeral cards wow. and i just said to myself wow and then i got the chills and and i felt that woman um that was in heaven was there watching me and i just felt it kind of like i'm feeling right now I'm feeling it too man. <laughs> and and uh and and then i just said hey she's here watching us and then uh i locked up closed the door went back on the radio to the studio and then the guy called and said hey guess what we got i got the job and he was so happy then he asked us hey did you guys do this and and i and i said no and and i denied it and that was the birth of breaking and entering christmas pretty cool and we did it every year we have been doing it every year since then and then in that was 96 and 98 uh, a guy named Steve Finley and another guy named Wally Joyner of the Padres called me and said, hey, you know that thing you do with Christmas? What do you do with those extra faxes? Because <laughs> we would ask people to fax us their, you know, their nomination of a family. And I go, you know, I don't do anything with them. And he goes, hey, give us those extra faxes you have. And Wally Joyner and Steve Finley took care of about 30 families between themselves. Wow. And then that was another arm of breaking and entering Christmas today. We do take care of one family on the air, but we take care of at least 60 families off the air with help from Steve Finley still. Wow. And that's amazing. Good, good man. Yeah. And uh, many other people, many other family, friends, uh, relatives, we all take care of families off the air. And, uh, and, and that's, and that's breaking. That's a great Christmas. legacy to have. I mean, uh, really, it we, were, is. we were told that that was called the golden rule. The golden rule it's just the right thing to do yeah. those types of things you are like um i'm gonna get philosophical a little bit <laughs> he's like a stone in, in a very very chilled relaxed pool of water and he was thrown into this community and the ripple effect that he has caused yeah in so many lives and you know what else i mean let's face it when you're in media it's usually the anchors, the reporters, the hosts mm -hmm. that get all the fame and glory mm -hmm. and, you know, attention. But it's the producer behind the controls or the third person that doesn't. And so you had something that sparked these older mm -hmm. guys that they yeah. liked you. You were no. funny. You were something. Uh, it was, um, well, back, we started on the radio back on May 3rd, 1988. The original lineup was Jeff and Jer, Ashley Gardner doing news and and Hank Bauer, one of my favorite chargers of all time. I do. It was it was there, it was those four plus me in the background. And then something happened day one. Um, some guy got stuck in the mud in Chula Vista. Oh. And uh and they said, Hey Tommy, or hey, what's your name again? <laughs> Tommy. And I go, Yeah, Tommy. They go, Hey, do you know anyone in that city, Chula Vista? Hello. <laughs> and so, um, remember, cell phones weren't really popular then. And so I called my friend Giovanni Sobreros, I guess on a landline. 
and I said, Hey, can you get near a payphone and get near that, that car that's stuck in the mud? And then Giovanni did and did a, a, a Live report, report, a report from a payphone. And then, and that was, then they were impressed. And then the next day something happened where they said, Hey, do you know? And then I got lucky in everything they always asked for. I got. And I didn't even know. That's what a, a go-getter. Yeah, and and uh, that's what, when then, that one person calls yeah. in sick or they're not there and they can yeah. see that somebody else is willing to, yeah. you know, to do it. And you did. And I mean, look at it. Look at everything that happened uh, since. So Everything's from, like, everything with him is from the heart. Yeah. And, and he know, worked I, hard, obviously. Yeah, well, he does. I mean, it does. But when you, you know? I think when you believe in what you do and you know where you've come from, it's very easy for him to give from his heart because he's, he has these life experiences not knocking college um it's a different type of education it's very important of course absolutely but the, the the hard knocks in the life that he's lived has made him i think the great person that he is absolutely this, is your, I, this is your tribute by the way <laughs> but i do want to say this the things that i am part of happen because of our listeners and our viewers everything that we have done from that human flag in 1991 and, and 9 11 human flag it, it it was all listener oriented. I mean, I can't believe it. You know, for 9-11, um, 11 days later on September 22nd, we decided to do a human flag. You remember that? And um, and I got my friend, Eric Mabry, mm -hmm. who is in marching band. Now he's a, a teacher and, you know, a director of marching bands at Olympian High School. Um, I called him and I said, hey, can you chalk up the field? We're going to try to do a human flag. And he goes, all right. And he goes, he goes, Tommy, for you to do this right, you need about 4,000 people to show up. And then we we went on the radio and said, you know, we want 4,000 people. We need 4,000 people. Please show up. We're going to do a human flag and send it to New York for those first responders at Ground Zero and, and honor them. And when that morning came on September 22nd, when, uh, when I looked out there, what we didn't get the 4,000. We got 40,000. Oh, wow. <laughs> it was crazy. And it was, everyone was stuck on the freeway. Wow. But if you were stuck I on the freeway, was... you feel, you felt part of it. And um, we circled, I mean, it was massive. 40,000 people at, at, at Jack Murphy Stadium, which doesn't exist anymore, uh, did the human flag. And that was, that was freaking awesome. Your uh, music's always been a big part of your life. You said that earlier. And you were yeah. in a band, right? I, I grew up, you know, in junior high, learning how to play guitar. I, right when I learned my bar chords, you know, uh, then I stopped wanting to learn. I go, wow, I can play a full song, just rhythm. And so that's why I could never uh, do Eddie Van Halen or anything like that. I can kind of play like Frampton because he's slow. <laughs> But uh, but I'm, well, I'm Eddie, Eddie, Eddie. Eddie is like the Michael yeah. Jordan of what he did. There's, and you he will was see a, a lot of these old photos in the documentary. I saw, well, I, I've seen pictures of him around yeah. for 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 many years, and uh, I still remember him with the long hair. <laughs> and the, and the, and he the, had the Keith Partridge look. Yeah, but but let's go to back to Laura <laughs> Castaneda. Laura, seriously, but thank you. I mean, this documentary when they this documentary is yours. And you know it's being screened at the Coronado Island Film Festival. It is huge, that's a, and that's we're a big deal. we're really honored. You know, the, 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 I love film festivals. I mean, you will see and hear stories at film festivals that you will not see anywhere else. And so that's, you know, San Diego has grown over the years. There's a lot of film festivals now, mm -hmm. and um, there's a, there's a good number of local filmmakers, which is always great. And it's wonderful to see students you know, carrying that passionate. legacy, very passionate about documentary films. And it's not easy to do a documentary. It takes time. It takes money. It takes passion. It takes finding people who um, will do it sometimes for the love of the art and the craft. Um, but it's not easy. And it's not easy to get the person that you're trying to interview to be cooperative. Sometimes they don't want that camera in their face, you know, and it's very awkward. It's very awkward. Uh... It can be, you know, it's it's more than just being a Kardashian and letting the yeah. cameras. No, it, <laughs> I this, mean, I know this podcast is kind of awkward. I'm trying to hold my gut in. So I, so I, <laughs> that camera is right there, aiming right at me. But uh, it's it's you look fine. You uh, do, uh, and it's you, you know but, letting uh, letting students follow you around for a year. I think it was like a year they uh, followed you around. Those I'm girls very, and I'm very Vince proud. And I'm very proud Pat, of this. Adon and all those other young wonderful students that I'm, followed you. I'm very proud of this, and I'm very grateful to Nanette Sosa and Laura Casaneda and all the, all those students. But when you talk about the Coronado Island film festival, 
you talk about important documentaries and I truly believe the important one to watch is the big dump. I mean, the big dump is the one to go to. Yes. Please go Thursday, November 9th to the, uh, win room. at I believe at the Coronado library, we will be, we will yeah, be there. That's for the, that's for this one, but we're going to be taking photos of you. But and, no, 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 uh, no, no. But the big one is the big dump. And that's important because I, I, you know, I work at KUSI and Dan plant and so many reporters do the, the Tijuana sewage problem and, um, and all that's going on from, you know, um, from the, all the past mayors, Bill Bray to Paloma, all of them are trying to figure this out. And then here you guys are bringing it to attention. And I have a feeling not only is it going to air at, uh, or screen at the, um, Coronado Island Film Festival on Friday, November 10th at one o'clock <laughs> at what theater? Coronado High. Coronado, Coronado High. Well, we're taking the six, 600 uh, seats that want to fill that. And See, it probably will, and it should. Okay, and now I'm a little jealous. This one <laughs> is at a small venue. You're playing the big one. No, that's good. Well, I think it's what, fitting. I, I, it has to I, be. I think, I think what it is is the timing of everything that's going on with it. Yeah. Um, your story uh, could play anywhere, and God bless Laura and Nanette. But the, in my opinion, and I think Laura will agree, the the documentary, the documentary to see at the Coronado Island Film Festival is the big dump because that is needs to have not only local um, notoriety, it needs to be known around the country and uh, honestly worldwide because of Mexico. So that you have an I important. I think it definitely will, and we have editorialized on this subject multiple times and received uh, commentary from officials on both sides of the border and we won't stop you haven't yeah. seen we, our, you haven't seen our film yet i have not seen the film yet. well we're waiting for november 10th okay i have not seen the film i would yet. love to get your thoughts on it and uh we've been really told there needs to be a part two the governor yeah. newsom's aware of it well he's saying it's not me right i mean about two weeks ago governor newsom said hey it's not a state thing um and 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 we have so many people from, you know, Paloma Geary to Brian Bilbray that are saying, Hey, wait a minute. That's not true. It's, 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 it is a state thing. You need it's to local, you, it's state, it's federal, it's mundial, global. Yeah. So I'm going to get, I'm going to get, I'm going to get in trouble because I'm going to say something uh, now that the media is not aware of. Go ahead. Say it. Oh, I can't believe I'm doing this. We can edit it. It's not no, live, no, right? No, this is live. <laughs> Is this live? <laughs> I'm just kidding. Oh, there's a dollar, a dollar. Okay. <laughs> oh, awesome. That's awesome. Yeah, Is that what you were going to say? No, You're passing no. the buck. Uh, when we had the the boiling of the water that yeah. took place yes. in Imperial Beach for a couple of days, yeah. Uh, there were, and this comes from reliable source. It's off the record of a few people that are very high up in um, government in San Diego. But have not gone on the record yet. So backtrack when they be what you're talking about was boiling the water to see if it was safe to take a shower and to brush your teeth uh -huh. in IB. Well, not just IB, in, yeah. uh, the K's yeah. and also San Isidro. Okay. And then one day they tested it and and they said, uh, yes, it's okay now. Right. 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 Okay. What's the real story? That is a real story. Okay. There's more to it though. Okay. 50 people were hospitalized that day. Wow. From Imperial Beach and from San Isidro, and they have the names of the individuals, and a lot of them don't want to go on record. Why? They're scared. They're, they're very hardworking families. Some of them are from from from, um, from Tijuana that live here, and um, they don't want to get involved because they're scared. Mm -hmm. uh, the health department's aware, aware of it, but the names are, you know, of these individuals. It's well known. I mean, it's been talked about. So this is something I'm probably going to get in trouble for saying a little bit, mm -hmm. but I don't care because I'm tired of this mess yeah. and I'm tired of people that um, don't have a voice. They're afraid to speak up and that's wrong. Well, and this is supposed to be, this is supposed to be uh, a city. A, I mean, I'm not blaming mayor glory at all. This is a state thing. This is a, this is the governor. It's a federal thing too. It, it Very is. Very much so. Well, someone needs, to, someone needs to, someone needs to, call it an emergency what is it yeah, that's that's, that's, that's it. it needs to be called an emergency because here's the thing uh he's right um because if people are getting sick and they have been hospitalized is the governor going to say it's a federal thing and more people are going to get sick 
Well, there was, you know, there was a, a big story on 60 Minutes also where Navy SEALs were saying that they were sick. And I think they may have, if I remember correctly, may have even filed suit. I don't, you know, don't quote me on that one. I, I it's my understanding. There's a lot, there's a lot more that we're not aware of than that people are not, that are not coming out. But and I, I know, and this is not about my film and I didn't want to get, I'm just very passionate. Well, I did. About I want to make it about your you're film. getting me fired up because I, I just, I don't like to see uh, people from our area treated that way. It's not right. The well, taxes this has been going on too long. Well, yeah. but it's es it's escalating it's escalating more and more because now UC UCSD has said it's an air quality issue and it was never that bad before. Yeah. It's beyond that now. I went to. I'm sorry. Uh, I didn't want to get in. I this. wanted to. That's important to do. I mean, this is about the Coronado Island Film Festival, right? Right. And it starts November eighth, and this one is on November 9th. But yours is at one o'clock November tenth mm. um, at Coronado High School. That's the important one to see. Please see this one too. Yes. But the important one that we need to tell people and they need they're to tell both, more people. They're both important for different reasons. Yours is important because there is an issue for uh, a lot of, and I know them because I hear these stories and I know you do a lot of work for Juvenile Hall and you go and mentor and you talk to the kids over there. I know about that. Uh, we, we did a lot, Clark Bartram, um, Steve Finley, Willie Santos, Gary Plummer, uh, Chief Brian Fennessy, uh, a few of those friends of mine, we uh, we have spoken at Juvenile Hall, but I have to admit, because of COVID in 2020, um, we haven't, but we're starting to go back. Good. We're starting to go back. Good. Let me know if I can help. I would yes. love to be part of that. Yes. I really believe in that. Those kids so need I, it. They, well, they, yes. they do, and there's, there's a real um, high rate of depression, more so right now than there ever has been because of COVID. And, and a lot of these kids um, are committing suicide too. We have a high suicide rate with that group. That's a very uncomfortable thing to talk about. But what he's doing in his life and what he's gone through, we, they need to hear this story. They really do. You know, when I do speak at Juvenile Hall, my opening line is, hey, I'm not a, I'm not a cop, I'm not a teacher, I'm not a counselor. You know, I'm just someone uh, who's a younger brother to two heroin addicts. And when I say that, then they all look at me and then they say, and I ask, does anyone ever, has anyone ever heard of uh, heroin? And they all raise their hand. And then right then, then I know I have them. And, uh, and then I tell my story and then they believe me because I haven't, I don't read books about this and I don't, I have, you know, I didn't go to school to talk about that subject, but, and they can, when you're at juvie, when you're in juvenile hall, I'm told that those guys in juvie, those kids, can tell in two seconds if you're full of oh they can yeah and if you absolutely yeah, can yeah and if and if if you're full of whatever uh they they'll, they'll just you turn around yeah. but i but i got lucky and the people that i speak with were not full of it and uh and and they and they see it and and it's all about relating to you know being raised by one parent and and having heroin in my life and that's why this is relevant more so right now, just as much about the ocean, because there is a lot of unraveling of the world and San Diego going on that needs to be healed. Absolutely. And a lot of times documentary film is the best way to do that. You know, a I've been a year. storyteller for a long time, but you're good, I, you're very good when at I started, I had to tell a story in a minute and 30 seconds. <laughs> And now I have a little bit longer to tell stories and doing them in print, writing pieces as well. So there's no shortage of great stories and not all of them are positive. Not, I mean, no. by that, you're not going to walk out feeling glorious. But I think when you watch Little Tommy, you see this film, I think there's a lot of hope that people will walk away with hope. We need, we, we need that right now more than anything else. And with your documentary, I haven't seen it yet. Yes. I am going to make it a point to see it. But I hope that sparks a lot of conversation and action because people are tired of this situation. It has been going on in this community too long. Who's responsible for your documentary? Well, Larry Delrose, of course, because um, without him, the funding wouldn't have come up. I mean, I worked on it for three years and lost two directors. Wow. I was going to direct it myself. I had editors. People dropped out. They just did, didn't want to finish it. So he's the money guy, but he also has a heart of gold and he loves this community and I, you know, he does a lot in the community. Well, he's known throughout the, the, not just here, but Palm Springs, Chicago. I mean, Mr. Entertainment, I mean, he's the guy with a heart of gold, just and like then, you. Uh, uh, no. And then no. I got, and then I got to thank um, Sarah 
Yes. Because Sarah Sarah put up with a lot of crap, as you probably like can. what exactly be um, specific. L- no, long, just kidding. Lo- just kidding. Lo- no, long long hours, long days. Um, you know, juggling the kids because we have a younger one too. Having to, to logistics, drive people. You know, drive them to school, get them situated. What are the names of your kids? Uh, my oldest is uh, Bon Bon. That's Yvonne, and then uh, McKenna. Mm-hmm. Then um, <laughs> who did I just who did I meet today? That's Ma- that's McKenna. What up, Mackenna? That's, Ma- that's Mackie. What up, Mackie? And then Bon Bon's, bon bon's uh, uh, Yvonne. She was a chef. she was an executive chef under Deborah Scott. Uh, I know chef. Learned, learned from one of the best. Yeah. And then of course Madison. Wow. And so Madison is um, an, already an honor student. She's almost Dang. six feet tall, playing volleyball, and probably going to get a scholarship. Wonderful. But you, all these logistic things of having to juggle family, plus the podcast, run the business. And this was a passion of mine, just like both of yours was, because it's storytelling, and it's it's hard to believe there's people in San Diego that are not aware of it still. You know what you're missing? The only thing missing here, you, honestly, you no, 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 no. <laughs> the only thing missing is an employee that's from Hawaii that's named after the moon. Do you know anyone? Is there anyone? Well, they, yeah, that would <laughs> after the moon. <laughs> oh, it's you have uh, Luna. Luna. Yeah. Luna's here. Yeah, just kidding. Yeah. Well, Luna, Luna's, <laughs> Luna's just come to us recently. Um, she was from Point Loma Nazarene. By way of Kauai. Yes. You, you thought you got that story, huh? Yeah. Awesome program. I taught there. They have a great pro- media program. Yeah, they do. They're doing Wonderful. phenomenal. We, we are blessed to have some really good colleges and universities and education systems in um, San Diego. I mean, we're, we're great. Who doesn't want to be? How hard is it to get in San Diego State now? Yeah. Right? Everybody wants to come to San Diego. Even, even it was easy to get into doing in the 80s into parties. I got oh into a God. lot of parties in the 80s. I got kicked out of some of those parties. <laughs> uh, and I just want to do a little plug for the community colleges yes. because they're under underrated in terms of the, the students that they serve as far as the programs that they offer. Well, there's a new program um, that was just approved by the governor. He did something positive. Yes. Is that 150 students that are from Tijuana can go to college here? Um, all expenses paid. Correct. Yeah. Well, I don't know if that's exactly the number, but what what will happen is that students will not have to pay out of 150 per out college of country I heard, I heard tuition, that. and classes at the community college level are forty six dollars a unit, which makes it much more affordable for students. Um, and I'm telling you, you can. I used to get a lot of students, and and some of these that worked on your documentary came from other, from colleges and universities where they just didn't get the hands-on that right. they get with some of the media programs in the community college system. Yeah. So they would come back after having a degree. You know, it's like, I want, I want to be a news reporter. I want to be a storyteller. Okay, here's, we're going to teach you how to use the camera and teach you how to interview people. Now go off and do it. Where does your passion come from? Because you, you're like all of us, we like stories. I love storytelling. He used to make me I laugh. He still makes me laugh. Wow. But story, because you're, 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 you're so hilarious on Jeff and Jer. Um, and there's one more story I have, I have to ask you about. All right. You're a storyteller, like, and we all are storytellers. When did you decide that education was going to be a huge part of what you do? Well, I grew up in the inner city. Um, we're about the same age. So around the same time you were at Castle Park doing what you were doing, I was in Chicago doing some things I probably shouldn't have done. God, this is, this but, sounds uh, fascinating. <laughs> but, um, it was really, so, um, I got into sports. Like your daughter playing volleyball and all You're that. You're a volleyball it's, player? Oh, yes. Love volleyball. That was the only thing I wanted to do more than be a storyteller was be a volleyball wow. player. But um, I took a trip out of Chicago, uh, downstate, to the University of Illinois um, at Champaign-Urbana to go visit some girls that had graduated from my high school a year You went earlier. to a party. I went to visit the campus and uh, my dad Tommy. worked for Greyhound bus line. So I got a free pass oh, and I was great. able to go. There you go. Um, and so it was see, being taken out of the neighborhood. Were you like 17, out of the hood. 18? Um, yeah. And just seeing a college campus and oh my so gosh, up, like, I want to do this. It opened up a world for it you. Absolutely did. So, it absolutely did. did. so, uh, and you picked English, of course, as your bachelor's. It wasn't my first choice, but because I didn't have the grades to get into the school of journalism. College of Journalism. I, I went into English and um, I got really lucky, like you, I, being in the right place at the right time. That's and it. I started my first job at the ABC station in Chicago. I mean, not I don't think I don't I don't believe that. in coincidence. I think um, I I think our stories are all similar in different ways. I have my own story and things. 
things he's not even aware of. Um, but I think we're being used as a tool to help other so people. Too. I think is what it really comes not down to. Used. I see it as we're, we, we are utilized as a tool. Yes. And utilized communicators and messengers. Uh -huh. I asked my priest about that. My priest friend who's no wow. longer with us. God bless him. Um, he told me that he said, you're a messenger. Yeah. So be careful what you do with those messages. And I think there's, you know, media is such a powerful tool, social media, uh, being able to tell a story that, you know, is going to make a difference like yours, hopefully will, right. Real difference, real. Impact. Hopefully all the work that we do makes a difference. Everything. I your that story one. giving hope to somebody else who sees oh. and hears about your story and says, you know what, if that little Tommy did it, I think I can do <laughs> well, it. Too. That's, that's absolutely true. So thank you to Laura Castaneda. Thank you and to Nanette, Nanette Sosa, Sosa for this one and, and those kids from the original city college group. So thank you. Is there a book? Do you have a book you're <laughs> you working on? You know what? In? When I met him, There's I told book, him right? that. Is the book uh, coming? Uh, I've been, uh, I've been asked, I've been calling around and asking people to help me with it. So yes, I already have, I already have it all in my head. So I have one part of the book I want to ask you about. Okay. Jerry Lewis. Yeah. How did that go down? I, when you, you, hear the you know, story, this, is, this is really cool. Um, when you say an, a name, I can, I know their phone I, number. I, I, I know, I know. So that, his that, phone that, when you say Jerry Lewis, I can, <laughs> I remember 619-233-8456, which was his phone number on the boat <laughs> called Sam, which was outside the Marriott. And, um, and he was, he just became a friend of the show. Uh, he became great friends with Jerry, J our Jerry, C Jerry from Jeff and Jer. Did you go outside um, his boat and like call uh, his name? We did a few bits. Uh, he wasn't the, expecting the, it. The one, time, and... <laughs> the one time he was in his boat, we knew he was in his boat. Um, I had a guitar and a bullhorn and I sang Dock of the Bay outside uh, his boat. <laughs> and I said, hey, Mr. Lewis, you know, uh, come on out. He didn't come out, but I left him a note to call us and he called. And, um, and then he became a friend of the show and became real close with Jer from Jeff and Jer. That's a great story. And there's many, yeah. many more like that. Yeah. There was somebody yeah. else you had mentioned recently that just passed away that you knew his agent and he was always, this person's agent always was hard to get through. Bob Barker. Yes. Yeah. Bob Barker. I had his home number and every time he was in the news, I would call and, um, he would always go on. And every time Bob Barker would go on. Two hours later, I would get a, a message. Remember those pink message <laughs> slips? A message at the front desk of the radio station saying, Tommy, call Henry Bollinger. He is upset you've got Bob on. And then that happened all the time. And then one year he told me, hey, Tommy, you know what? Bob Barker is okay with you. You can call anytime. How many times did you go through that process without asking his permission? Like 12. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but we became friends. I right. I appreciate. I feel like we need to do something down the road again. This was phenomenal. You guys uh, were just rocked it. Uh, you did rocked you it. Did you have fun? Yes. Yes. I didn't have as much fun as I wish I did because I wasn't there as the faculty advisor. I wasn't there every time the students were out. Oh, he did you have fun Tony. today? Oh, today. I thought you meant during the documentary. I'm sorry. I misunderstood. Well, did both. Well, you, you know, I, as I said, we we kind of picked up where the students left off. So there was... You know, with no budget, you know how that is. You know, I we the net is a full time professor. I'm I'm not only teach one class online, but I'm a full time deputy editor at the UT. So my time is limited. I have children. You know how it is. So I wish there were things that we could have done differently with the documentary. But we we took what the students did, and they did a lot of work. Thank and you. we just tried to make it work with thank you crystal had. right i know crystal crystal and, and maria and vince and adon and um without nanette sosa this would not have happened thank you because she was adamant about you know she knew you from way back when or knew who you were and said that's a great story i didn't know about all that other stuff that you're telling <laughs> me and we yes we should finish it right, and we right. did so yeah. i you know i'm happy that we were able to finish it because like you said, I kept my word. <laughs> awesome. And God bless Sarah. She's been trying to wrap us for the last hour. <laughs> but yes, this, this was amazing this today. On, this, this, took was on, this took on an energy of itself. Thank you both for your right. your time because your, your yes. schedule is so tight. Um, we've been trying to get together forever. This is like, this uh, is fun. This is to me is like Thanksgiving. This Aww. is great. Thank you, it's Coronado like being, Island this Film is to Festival, me, for to me, this is like being film. with family. Thank it you. really, it really is. I mean, and there's I, a two of us to connection. 
Yes. All the way because I live in Chula Vista. Too. Happy birthday, <laughs> Luna. <laughs> Is it your birthday? Yesterday. Oh, my gosh. I got some stuff for you then. <laughs> you guys are going to miss out on some really delicious. Here's a shameless plug. Hans and Harry's. Right? I know that place. It's the place. Everybody take care and remember, attend the Coronado Film Festival. Take care and be nice to each other.